The information presented in this program is not intended as legal, health, or nutritional advice. All topics are provided for informational purposes only and are not necessarily endorsed. Neither Light On nor its host accepts responsibility for any statements, views, or opinions presented in this episode. All rights reserved. All right, welcome to the 40th episode uh, of A Light On, uh, coming to you live from the new uh, multi-million dollar A Light On Studios. Howdy, I don't know if you knew that. Um, if you're new to the podcast, uh, please uh, consider subscribing on YouTube, Apple, BitChute, and Odyssey, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, if you'd like to support the podcast, there'll be links in the description. And uh, my special guest today is uh, Howdy uh, McCoskey. Am I pronouncing that right? That is perfect, actually. Excellent. Howdy mm -hmm. McCoskey. He's the author of the book, Exit the Cave, among others. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. Um, so just to preface this, this, this is a little bit of a dark subject, I would say. Um, it's maybe not for the mm -hmm. faint of heart, um, but it's not it's not all bad it's a it's a theory like everything else and we we really don't know anything at the end of the day i think um but um so what is what exactly is the the soul trap theory if that's a good uh descriptor for it and how did you how did you come into it kind of you know researching this what 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 made you think about it and start writing about it sure yeah it's uh so it it, it can sound of course, to the average person, very negative, these ideas, um, because it takes away the standard foundations that everybody has for their beliefs of life, and we can get into that. So it sounds negative on the surface. The end result of it is like if someone's actually read the whole book <clears throat> and made it through the difficult parts, they'll start to see that mm -hmm. there is there's there's a reason for it at the end. There's There's a knowledge at the end, and there is a there is a power or there is an inner knowing or there's an inner there's an inner peace to us that we generally don't know about because we're layered with so many walls of fall so many layers of garbage and getting through all the garbage is very very difficult and that's that's the when people feel that it's negative mm -hmm. and like i tell everybody yeah it's a thesis it's uh, mm -hmm. i don't know for sure what's going to happen after we die i don't know for sure how this reality was created how and who and what did it this is just 25 years of work sharing how I see oh. things to get people to think for themselves. It's all about you deciding, taking in the information, not rejecting it, not accepting it, and letting it swirl around and think, is this, is this something possible? So I just mm -hmm. put that out as an initial disclaimer, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been doing, so I've been digging into this stuff for 25 years. I went through, you can't come to discussions and theories like I have and, and, Anybody who sort of says, I've been thinking like this a lot of my life too, hasn't, hasn't had an easy life. You've had, a, you've had to have a difficult life um, to start seeing reality as not being wonderful and, and, and beautiful. So in my case, um, I, I had an okay upbringing. Um, not great. I had a father that was a psychopath, stole all my money just before I uh, finished university, made that really difficult. As soon as university ended, I had a girlfriend that was murdered, ex-girlfriend that was murdered. And as these things began to pile up, as more and more things in the world began to get messier and messier around me, I had to start asking questions. What the hell is this place? Like, like what is a, and then of course, once you look around and see the, the suffering of the world and you start to see the, the pain that animals and nature and everything else is under, you start, you start asking these questions. I got to the point where I was so depressed with life, I wanted to kill myself. Hmm. Uh, that was like 1997. Um, a program came on on Egyptian pyramid building, and I realized that's that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and and the depression ended like instantaneously, and I began eight year study on ancient Egypt and the Maya and alchemy and native uh, Indian traditions and whatnot. Wrote the book Power of Then. Um, thought I knew something at that point. I thought I was pretty smart. Then I fell in a canyon, had a death experience. Uh, that put me through about ten years of 
really difficult uh, experiences, some clarity, but also confusion, difficulty. But I wound up writing another book, Falling for Truth. Um, then three years ago, I wrote Exposing the Expositions when I dug into the, the lies of the 1800s, specifically the World's Fairs. Yeah. And as I got through, I started my YouTube channel around that time. And in the midst of all of our world stupidity now, as our world insanity <laughs> increased, um, I was doing more videos about spiritual warfare, this idea and the idea of Plato's cave and what that is. And I, I finally felt at the, at the beginning of this year, I should, I think I should write a book about Plato's cave. That should be my next book. And as I started to write and research Plato's cave, which we can talk about, um, I started, it, things just pushed me deeper and deeper into something that I had looked into years ago, but semi rejected, semi pushed away. And that's the idea of a soul trap and what that is, or a reincarnation trap. If we had to put it into like a sentence, in fact, I'll read um, for everyone out there, if I can just find my book, a gentleman named Wayne Bush, who has a great website called Trick by the Light. Uh, he has this on his website. This is as good of an introduction as I could possibly give is one from, from my own book that I put in. Hmm. A topic that has had much focus over the last 10 years comes under the subject soul traps. And in a nutshell is saying that non-human beings either created this realm or control this realm and bring human souls into an, after, into an artificial world construct. They do this in order to farm humans for food using our energy mainly in the form of fear and other negative emotions like the movie Monsters, Inc. as their source. When we die, we get tricked at a key moment when we can turn away from all this by aliens disguised as beings of light or former loved ones. You would then go into a tunnel of light or up a stairway of light. Doing either will cause us to enter the reincarnation cycle and be back into another life in the soul farm. So that's as good a description of the overall theory, I think, as we can share. And where would you like to go with it? What would you like to what would you like to discuss about it? Yeah, well, I just want to say, um, you know, I had been researching and having podcasts about the near death experiences before I discovered you. And, you know, I'd already I've already kind of changed my mind and or at least allowed other possibilities to come in um, because something did click about this theory because something is not something is not right you know what i mean with this with this mm -hmm. realm and it never has seemed that way to me and you make a lot mm -hmm. of good points um and so you you in the book i haven't read through all of it but what i have read uh was really great and you, you described uh sort of the the afterlife as a or near-death experiences as a propaganda campaign and I was like, holy shit, you know, there's propaganda even after this. <laughs> so it's like, I was really bummed out about that. But um, I do, I do appreciate like the, you know, the realistic approach of your book. It's both terrifying and hilarious to me because I, I really like dark humor and you make some, you make some great comments in the book about, you know, your, your grand meeting your dead grandma and, and stuff like, like that. I, thought, I find that stuff funny. So it is kind of, um, it is kind of a bummer at first, but, uh, there's, there's a lot to it. So, um, do you really, do you really believe that there, there's a propaganda campaign? What, what did you research, I guess, to kind of come to this conclusion? Was there one thing or what, what hit, hit it home for you? Yes. Well, of course, it's it's partially was 25 years of my life and my experience and dealing with for a while I did. I was in the healing field because you're kind of you're kind of pushed into that when you start. Really, I'm a philosopher. I'm not any kind of healer. Right. But when you move into these fields, you're kind of told, oh, you're supposed to do this, too. And and I had trained with some native Indian medicine men and uh, a, a Korean Zen monk. And so I thought I should. OK, I'm supposed to. We're supposed to do it. So and then. So many of the people that I was helping in these healing sessions were like, like if I thought my life was horrible, it's like their life is horrible times 10. You know, it's just like frighteningly bad and not by no fault of their own, right? Literally the universe just steamrolling them from the moment they were born. So I'm putting all this together and starting to recognize like, you know, the standard story that we get told, and I believed it too as a kid. I mean, we all kind of do that. Uh, loving creator created this place, created it as a place for us to learn and grow and gain experiences and have some challenges and uh, make some choices and then eventually become perfect and go and join this father again. But of course, we're told, well, actually, you were perfect before you joined and then you came down here to learn some lessons. 
uh, so I'm perfect. Yeah. And you're coming here to learn lessons. Yeah. So, so I can become perfect again. Yeah. But I'm already perfect. Yeah. <laughs> what was the point then? What's the point of coming into a, a realm of suffering for that? And, and then the yeah. questions begin to die out. So when I started going into the book and I started realizing the story of Plato's cave is nothing like what we think it is. It's, it's another story of misdirection probably. Um, I started looking into, okay, the near death experience, because my near death experience, I didn't, I didn't cross over specifically. My near death experience was mm -hmm. all within the, the, the physical matter, physical realm matter, but I had done enough uh, of these uh, shamanic journeys and, and uh, healing work where I was in, you might say in another realm, in the astral realm, bridging where this, so, so I've had, I've touched this realm and some really weird stuff there without actually dying. Uh, once I started realizing, okay, the soul trap is a possibility, and I'm taking it as a possibility at the beginning of my research, I started digging into near-death experiences. And thankfully, there's some, there's a lot of, like you say, YouTube channels that have uh, people that are interviewing people with near-death experiences. So there's, there's thousands of those out there. There's a site called NDERF, I think it's called, that has another five or 10,000 um, cases that people have put up. Uh, Mark over at Forever Conscious Research, he does a great job of discussing people's near-death experiences. So, so I started digging through them all. And what you've got, what it tends to be is 85% are exactly what people would expect. If you ask the average person like right now watching this, what's a near-death experience? They tell you, oh, white light, tunnel, Jesus, dead grandma, feelings of okay. love, life review, um, told you not, told is not your time. You know, with a few pieces yeah. and things added up, but that's that's the general story that, that people hear. And um, it's hard because generally when I started, and the more I looked in, and I've known some people who've had these near-death experiences, and uh, and I've read about uh, lots of others that was doing this, They, when someone has one of these, they tend to come back and they become better people. They change, they transform, they become more loving, they become more kind, they they see that they were, had been very egotistical, and they make these changes. And so on mm -hmm. the surface, you think, this is great. Why would someone like me be in any way having anything negative to say? Because you see the result of the people who've had them when they come back are fantastic. However, there's 15% of them that tend to be ignored that tend to never get talked about. All the researchers push those ones to the side. And these are the ones where it seems like people have gone a little bit farther. I call the, the near-death experience we know of as being in the waiting room at the dentist's office. It's not too bad out there. <laughs> yeah, You got some magazines. It's fairly good. Right. Some people, though, seem to actually go through the door and get close to the dentist chair. And they see something very, very different. They start to see that those beings that look like Jesus or dead grandma or whoever uh, they fall apart in their, you know, demonic alien beings. We start to see wow. that everything that's going on for them is a is a trick. It's a trap. It's a deception. It's a pressure. It's a forcing them to try to do what these beings want them to do. And so as I began to step back and put all that research together, I started to realize if you were running a scam like this, if you were running a reincarnation scam for souls, which was have an experience, suffer, create a bunch of energy, die, take all the rest of the energy and deceive you to go back into thing and do it again. You would want to have some people have experiences that are really, really nice to kind of send them back and make sure they tell everybody white light is fantastic. It's full of love. I feel so wonderful. It's beautiful. If you if it, just go to it, everything's going to be fine. So to me, I started to see we're probably dealing with a propaganda tool at the very least. And I'll shut up here and then let you talk. If yeah. um, if I have a message now about the after death experience, it's this. It's simply this, and that is nobody should. I mean, my I'm done. Right, I'm done with this whole matrix. Everything about it. I'm going home. I'm finished. But nobody else has to have the same feeling I do. You you know. And the most important thing to me is if you can be aware when you're in the after death experience, which is a part of our learning. Just take your time. Decide what you really want. If you really want to come back into this world, great. If you want to go do something else, great. But don't be, don't get pushed into it. Don't get forced into it. Stand in your power long enough to be able to decide the thing you most want to do. And why not? If it's truly the most loving experience imaginable, if it's truly the greatest thing for you, these beings will wait. They'll wait a few days or a few hours or a few months for you to make the decision. Go, yeah, okay, I'm going to go with you. If anything, like, like anything in this world, we know if someone's pressuring you across that table to sign the contract, you know, you got to sign it now. If we don't get this signed now, you know, we, we know 
something's wrong because if it's a good deal, they'll sign it tomorrow. No, come back tomorrow. No problem. If it's, we got to do it now, there's always something wrong with it. So if anything, for me, it's, it's just to, part of this is just to get people to say, when I get into that experience, I want to be in a place where I can look around a bit. I can check things out. I can ask some questions and I can make the right decision for me. That's really fascinating. Um, because yeah, primarily the people I've talked to in the near death experience kind of groups, you know, they have a great experience. It's really positive. They feel really comfortable and going back and all that stuff. Um, I did do a podcast on a small percent. I think it's like 4% of people have a hellish experience. Uh, I was wondering where that fit. Is that kind of what you're talking about where they see things falling apart or is that a totally different thing? Because they see what kind of like the standard version of biblical hell, you know, demons and all that stuff. Yeah, that's in that 15. So remember, I said there's 15% that is kind of not like the normal experience. So within right. the 15%, there's different kinds of that experience, right? Okay. Yeah. So some have a totally hellish experience. Some are, um, some are, you know, seeing a, a demonic being. Some are just in a really confused place. Some are... You know, it's, it's all really, really different. I have, uh, you, I don't know how much of the book I gave you, but chapter nine, I'll, I'll make sure you have the book, by the way, if I didn't give you the whole thing when we're done. Be great uh, but I have you. chapter nine, which is what I'm calling uh, non-standard near-death experiences. And this chapter tells us, uh, I go through a, like about maybe 20 different ones of people who've had very strange experiences and who basically are saying, who pretty much come out of it saying, this whole thing is just a giant scam. You know, that's it. That, that's all it is. That's kind of how they're, you know. Um, religions, like here's one. Religions teach us that a false, uh, that teach of a false God that is not the true God of the afterlife, but probably a demonic entity in itself who poses as the true God. Um, this is the description of fear and darkness. God is not a demanding, bloodthirsty, bipolar control freak bent on balancing some sin balance sheet. Pressure does not originate from him. Pressure is fear-based, um, fear-based, which originates from darkness. And so there's all of these different examples that I have here of, of these other pieces of the puzzle. And to me, those are the most important because generally researchers ignore them. Uh, and and it, it would be different if like, because to me, if somebody had, was researching and they got 85 ones that are all the same, yeah, okay, you know, you've got to take that the data, what you've got, but then you've got this right. other stuff that's really, really different. And you should say, we really want to explore this too, because what are what are they telling us? And it seems like it, it literally often gets just pushed to the side. We need to keep the happy message going. The happy, wonderful love message needs, needs to be uh, continued. And... Um, yeah, so I mean, I've come to see this more like a. I've become more like a Cathar agnostic in the course now of the last like year or so, and now I see this as a suffering pit of hell that has <laughs> some moments of beauty in it, some moments of of like plateau moments, or almost like like if you're if you're squeezing something for energy, eventually you've got to give it a break. You got to give it a break to retool. And so beautiful moments, loving moments, generally that's what they're there for. They're there to give before they come back. But it's not just, it's the weird thing is it's not just negative experience we're getting mined for. It's the good ones too. That's the part yeah. that people tend, the people tend to think I'm having a happy experience now. So that's all good. And we're not still asking, but there's energy being created in all experiences. Where is the energy going? And if you don't know where the energy is going and if you're not in control of it, it almost doesn't matter what the experience is because it means you're not in control of the very basic principle of this of this matrix, which is energy. And it would make sense, you know, if you if you read like the, the biblical stuff and I believe it to be allegory, but, you know, in, in the Bible, the devil is a great deceiver. Right. And, and his uh, deception comes in sort of like wrapped in a, in a pretty boat. Right. It's not like all hellfire and and suffering because that wouldn't really work very well right right like anything any cult right nobody mm -hmm. if the cult leader if they gave all their details on day one you met them no one would ever join the cult right the cult has to present something at the beginning that sounds like a good idea and generally there's always something in all of them that 
makes sense at the beginning, especially if you're a bit confused, like, good idea. I like that. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while before you start to see, wait a minute, what the hell's going on? But when you, when you see the near death experience um, and the big, one of the big parts of it is this feeling of this, this overwhelming love, this overwhelming sense of love, which the way I've come to see it is acting like a drug. It's acting, it's acting the same way as someone who's taken ecstasy or any other drug. They are, they're so overwhelmed with emotion that they can't think clearly. And at the, at the very moment of time when you need to be at your most clear thinking, because in the after death realm, which is the astral realm, you're dealing with a, a realm of emotion. There's very little um, con uh, uh, um, uh, logical thought there to start with. It's mm -hmm. like a tremendous amount of work to learn how to bring the logic into the astral. So you're already in a completely emotional place. And now you think about it, you get bombarded with the greatest emotion you've ever felt in your life. And especially if you notice too, a lot of the people who've had near-death experiences generally have had difficult lives. Generally, they, they're, they're not somebody who say, I had the greatest life ever. Everything was perfect. And then I had this death experience. And I, but, you know, they, a lot of these people have suffered hard. They've had really, really tough lives. And all of a sudden, they go through something like this where they feel so good. Of course, after you've gone through such hell, of course, you'd want to grasp to that as being the answer, right? Because that's what spirituality is. And spirituality is a certain, I wrote about this in Falling for Truth. That's kind of what that whole book is all about. It's this idea of people are searching to feel better. They're not searching for truth. I, like we're, we're having a discussion about what's possible truth, capital T truth, um, which is not meant to make anyone feel better or feel worse. It's just what's true. As opposed to the spiritual search, which is how do I feel better? I don't feel good. I'm suffering. I'm in pain. How can I stop that? How can I have endless happiness? That's the spiritual search. And there are lots of people out there making billions and billions of dollars selling books and videos and workshops to teach you how to get, and you can for a while, mm -hmm. you can get happier. You can feel, and I'm one too. I'm really glad with the things I've learned if I'm not feeling well or something in my body's not feeling well to learn some little techniques to improve it. That's important. I think that's a valuable tool here, but it's not really truth. Truth is about finding everything that's false and removing it. And whatever you have that's left that you can't get rid of, that's the truth. And everyone does the opposite. They think they already know what the truth is. And so they're they're going for, for a particular truth goal, never realize, but never understanding. If you already knew the truth, you wouldn't have to seek for it. So if you have to seek for truth, it means you don't know what it is. So go find what's not true. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And eventually... Uh, as my, one of the people I've come to trust, Richard Rose says, if you drop, you'll drop everything until you come to the one thing you cannot drop and you'll try, but you can't drop it. And then you're going to realize that's the truth. Wow. And it should always be surprising because if the truth turns out to be what you thought it was, then how do you know you haven't been fooling yourself? How do you know you're not tricking yourself or just creating the thing you wanted to create? If the truth shows up as being, holy crap, that's the truth. Really? Wow. You, you would feel it. You would feel that it you would trust the experience far more, I would think. Yeah, there is a sort of intuition behind it, I think. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, um, before we get too far mm -hmm. off the, the path, uh, so the people who see these beings in their true form, uh, are they describing what it, what we know as like typical aliens, like greys, or what, what, what are the different variations, if any, that they're seeing when they get uh, these experiences? Yes. Um, some some are some are seeing all sorts of different things. Some see them as like just reptilian beings. Some see them as yeah, gray like beings. I, I think it's more. Um, it's not so much. I think they're really seeing the being. They're more seeing a um, their own <laughs> deeper minds picture of what's going on outside of them. If that makes sense. Um, I'm just going to try to find one here for you. Um, elegantly asked what the meaning of life was thoughts in the back of my head because uh, I have a really good one in here that talks about it was somebody who was seeing um, seeing these uh, like you know these beings of light and then all of a sudden they changed on them and became something completely different 
Um, mm. Of course, now that we're sitting here, of course, I can't find it. But um, <laughs> ge- yeah, ge- generally, they're just they're, I, I wouldn't say there's one specific thing. People see X, but people see things that they know right away that they're seeing a more true depiction of whatever that thing was in front of them. And they knew that whatever was in front of them that they first saw was a type of screen. Uh, We get this a lot in um, people who talk about alien abductions, who talk about the beings that often, you know, they say they come into their bedroom at night and then, then take them away that they're, they don't see them as aliens when they first often come into the room, they see them as their friends or their relatives or, whatnot, right? They see them, they see them in forms that are pleasing to them. And it's only after a while they start to realize that in a sense, these these beings have read their mind and have created a, an image that mm. is pleasant to the one that's looking at them. But that 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 would be the best description I get in a lot of the near-death experiences I've read that are different. They they all claim that the being was presenting itself the way it was because it was reading my or had been reading my mind and in a sense knew my entire life history so it could pull out this is the best image to use to fool the person in front of me so if we're kind of <laughs> I, I bring that up because uh, uh i had this happens a lot to me in dreams at night um sure. i don't know if this happens to you quite often but i'll have a dream particularly when there's somebody from my past who i've been close to and obviously I haven't talked to in a long time, maybe even 20, 30 years. And here they are in my dream. And so I notice I let my guard down very, very quickly because it's like, this is someone not only close to me, but someone I haven't known, I haven't seen for a long time. And so I'm very open in the dream. I'm excited to see them again. And, you know, then I wake up from that dream and I'm exhausted. Like I'm tired and I, I my thoughts are very bizarre. They're strange and they want me to do weird things. And I start to realize, I, I, stop, I, I kind of catch it if I can remember the dream. Like, wait a minute, that wasn't who that was in the dream. That was some kind of entity pretending to be that person. And then I think about the dream more and then I can find something very weird in the dream that was kind of like a, you know, piece of junk energy stuck into me and I've kind of got to find it and get rid of the junk energy. And then all the thoughts go away and the tiredness goes away. And so I think that's a little, a tiny taste of what's probably going on in the after death state, or at least something we all should be aware of if we're taking this whole thing seriously of, we want to, we want to regain our authority and our own sovereignty and over what happens in our entire experience. And we have to be prepared for all the possible tricks and deceptions that could be thrown at us. For sure. Uh, I'm wondering what you think about David Icke's uh, theories. He wrote a book recently called The Trap, which was great, a great book. And he uh, really kind of leans toward the the reptilian theory. And uh, but in his theory, they and I've, I've studied this quite a bit, they, they sort of work together, the greys and the reptilians, like the greys are sort of uh, some kind of half biological foot soldier of the reptilians, if that's a that's the best way I can think to describe it. Um, but uh, do you hold any stock in his theories? I think he's overcomplicated a lot. Um, that's the best way I would put it. He, yeah, he's overcomplicated a lot of things. And there's, um, on one hand, he's done some decent work, I think. And, um, and I think he's made some um, miscalculations in others. Um and the hard part is individually going through the stuff yourself with a with a real fine tooth comb and saying, okay, let's pretend 50% of this is true and 50% of this is false. How do I figure out which side it falls on? And, and I think that's that's part of the journey of, of re- anybody's, like reading my book too. I can guarantee you, I do not have 100% truth in this book, guaranteed. If I got 50%, I'm thrilled. So it's like everybody else, it's like, okay, dig through the book. What's, what do you think you can hold on as true and what are the parts that are false? <laughs> or at least maybe not false, but not entirely correct either. So um, so that's one part of it. Then the next part of it is always, what are we doing about it? What, what do you do? And that's, that's the part that's missing out there in many cases. It's there, th- this this topic is beginning to be discussed in the last two or three years. It's kind of the new zeitgeist, you know, like 10 years ago, it was flat earth. And then it became the Mandela effect. And then it became this Tartaria mud flood thing. And now it's kind of the soul trap. 
reincarnation. It, it, it's been the last couple of years. It's just bubbling all over the place. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of repeating concepts there, of which, of course, my book repeats some of them as well. I, I hope my book has gone into completely new areas of research for people. But the next step is, is obviously where I'm going, where the where my work is headed is the specifics of, yeah, but what do you do? Which is, of course, the most important. If, if A is true, well, what's B? What's your what's your what's the way of handling yourself? And I find that that's that's kind of lacking um, out there. But there's also probably a reason for it because this is a pretty like you say, not just a dark topic, but it's a pretty dangerous topic because if it's correct, then that means these beings, which we call archons, demons, whatever you want to call them, are doing their best to make sure souls don't leave. So if anybody out there is giving really good information for souls to leave, hmm. that might get shut down really quickly. So there's also this, this game that has to be played of if you have information, what do you share? How much do you share? Where do you share it? And so it's a question of maybe there's a reason we don't see too much. It's either A, people don't really have the knowledge that they think they do, or the ones that do have it are kind of being very careful with the detail that they put out, knowing the the situation of this realm. Well, I would think it's a very select few people who know who know the truth about everything and they're kind of running the show. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, um, there, of course, they would keep things quite quiet. Right. I'm beginning to, I'm beginning to understand more of the stories of those Zen masters who, once they had realized everything, just packed up a bag and went to a mountaintop and just lived there by themselves. And if one or two people wanted to hike up the mountain and actually see them in the course of, of life, okay, great, they'll see them. But other than that, they're just, they're just leaving all this behind. And I can, I can see the, I can see the choice. Um, I kind of feel that of way. Howdy. I've felt that way for mm. a while now. <laughs> yeah, like I want to escape. The... Well, you know, like how, how do you have, if I want to be honest and have a real conversation about anything, even the world, even the way the world is right now, even the insanity of the world right now. And I sit down next to somebody um, in a coffee shop, let's say, let's pretend I don't go to coffee shop. Let's pretend I did still go. And somebody I didn't know sits across from me, says, hi, how you doing? And we start having a conversation and start asking me some questions about things. If I started speaking honestly about anything, they're going to think I'm insane. Like they're, they're just going to think I'm nuts. And, uh, and uh, maybe even potentially think I'm dangerous. So why, why would you want to create a problem for yourself? So it also becomes the more you begin to but I don't want to say no, but the more you begin to potentially see what reality may be and the, and what the matrix is and what Plato's cave is and, and our, our actual interaction with it, the less you feel you want to communicate with the world at all. You will yeah. naturally start to feel like you either want to be by yourself or you want to be with a very select group of people who you feel you can openly have discussion with yeah. because um, it gets painful to try to have to try to have discussions with others. And so I'm sure in your own way, you probably feel that, that, that you, you have to choose who you talk to. Yeah, absolutely. It's been really hard to live as part of normal society. <laughs> and I mean, I'm always shocked at the level of ignorance of, of normal people. I mean, how you can go through even <laughs> the last few years, right, without even an inkling that something is amiss. You know, you, it just doesn't occur to them or they come up with reasons why it's OK. And it's like, no, it's not. It's not fucking OK. Like none of that was OK. And then, I mean, you're still talking about things that happened like 20 years ago, you know, um, and they still don't even believe that. So it's like, yeah, I mean, you you're surrounded by a, a very few people, if you're lucky, you know, that that get it because um, most of them don't. It's really scary. Um, and this more scary for me though was getting yeah. real quick is the all the spiritual teachers who have said nothing in the last three years spiritual teachers who are supposed to be the leaders to ultimate freedom were not concerned about the loss of relative freedom and so a yeah. whole lot of people that i kind of kept in possible high standard or thought their books or their value have said something of, of, of knowledge if you can't see this like you can't see this, what's right in front of you 24-7. As far as I'm concerned, you don't see anything. 
And I, yeah. I dropped a whole lot of, you might say, teachers in the garbage. Absolutely. Yeah. They all went out the window for me because you realize that they're, yep. you know, they're, they're worried about this, you know, their paycheck or they're worried about what people think about them. They're not, they're not, uh, you know, doing anything for the spirituality of, of humanity or, or anything uh, good. Um, do you think there's any, there's any good that can come from helping other people? Like, is there any obligation for us here to, to wake people up or is it just useless? <laughs> No, there's no obligation for that. In fact, generally trying to people, anyone trying to save the world, trying to fix the world is going to find out that um, you're up against a juggernaut that you have no idea what you're up against. And it's just going to grind your energy to a halt. We do, though, have or I hope people will have an empathy, though, to recognize that all of us who are divine sparks, not everybody's a divine spark here, right? But all of us who have divine spark within us, and that includes trees and animals and fish and birds and whatever has the divine spark in them we're all trapped together so that hopefully there's an empathy towards others from the standpoint of just like hey we're all in the same boat together we're all suffering together so if there's a way i can help um help another creature have less suffering today that's that's a just a i think that's a natural nice thing to do mm -hmm. but i don't feel like I have to save any trees or save any birds specifically, or, you know, or certainly we get, to, I think everybody, once, once someone finds out there's something wrong, seriously wrong with the world and seriously and finds out it's insane, uh, seems to get the feel and, and gets, and what they feel has some kind of answer, some kind of system, some kind of organization they're in. There's a natural tendency to, I'm, I need to go tell everybody I need to, I need to, I need to change the world, fix the world. Yeah. And people will go and do that for five or 10 years. And then usually they exhaust the hell out of themselves. And then think how many people in the last hundred years, just the last, okay, let me last 50, the last 50 years who have been praying for world peace, meditating, who've been going around the world, have been try trying to save this, is the world any better than it was 50 years ago? Actually, it's probably much, much worse. So my suggestion to everyone is instead, we're dealing with energy and energy is a finite resource. And it's important to know what are you doing with your energy? Where is it going? Where are you putting it into practice? Trying to seemingly fix the world is not a good use of energy, but using that energy for yourself and for a small community that seems to have great transformative value. Like if you have a group, if there's a group of 20 or 30 people or a small little village and that energy is going to building that and transforming that, we seem to have great strides. So I think it's it's a sense of you, you kind of have to have this way of being of value when you're here just because that's just an empathetic way of being. But it's it's narrowing your helping scenario to something that's actually manageable Otherwise, that energy is just going to go all over the place and you're going to wind up having done a whole lot of work and accomplish nothing. Right. So you said some of us are divine sparks and you have you have this theory of NPCs in, in whatever this realm is. Can you can you go into that a little bit? Do you think some people really are NPCs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I still like to not use the term anymore. That, that's just mm -hmm. sort of that's now the term that people have heard right a, a non-player character yeah um sort of a, an ex like an extra in a movie yeah uh, I've, I've started calling them uh, what did i call them a uh, possible soul vehicles i think that's what i called it, it just means that there are uh, and that's not even the right word i shouldn't use that word even possible divine spark vehicle because every everyone and everything has a soul so everything has a soul like there's no difference between like let's say someone someone's calling an npc and someone who's not there's there's like almost no difference between the two both have to eat the same way they, they handle the food the same way they relatively think the same way they process the same way mostly except those who have a divine spark those who the divine spark went into prior to birth um have one um more of, of greater capacity for energy inside so they have greater greater power at their at their doorstep if they can access it and they have a greater ability it seems for deep questioning and thinking the non what, what these, these um the ones without the divine spark won't think deeply 
whatever whatever answer is presented to them, that's the answer. You know, oh, if the U if the U.S. Uh, Air Force had just been show, had just been shooting on a bunch of balloons, okay, that's what they are. There's no need to question it. I don't need to think <laughs> even think about it. Why would I think about it? It's yeah. that's what they said. So. The difference is those are the divine spark and who has some of that active within them just naturally starts to wonder, how do I know that? How do I know what that is? And they'll start questioning. They'll start thinking. So that's that's the only difference. It seems like a small difference, but it's actually quite big because you're never going to get out of a soul trap without a lot of deep philosophic questioning. Like you can't meditate your way out of this place. You can't happy your way out of this place. You can't love your way out of this place. You have to you have to remember your way out of this place. It's a process of remembering. And the only way you can start to remember is to highly, is to think clearly on what you have forgotten. Hmm. And I think, I think you mentioned, I mean, there's, there's certainly people who don't question anything as we, as we mentioned. So that kind of, that kind of makes sense to me, but I think you mentioned something in one of your, videos about that it could also be the other way around like those seemingly npc people are here to because we fucked up and we're not like we didn't get it right right is that is that correct yeah i like this one it comes from a book uh replay by ken grimwood a novel mm -hmm. which was the kind of like the original groundhog day guy instead of living a day over he's living his life over and over and over again and in one of the lives, this woman that he become come close to didn't come back. He came back into that life aware, but she was like her non-aware self, her regular self at that age, at 16 or whatever. And he started wondering, well, did she uh, become enlightened in the last life? So she, because she came enlightened, she didn't, her consciousness didn't need to return into this body. So the body just goes through, it does its, the all the bodies just run a certain, uh, have a certain thing that's here. Um, but if consciousness comes in, that consciousness isn't complete yet. So he began thinking, maybe I'm one of the last ones to get it, that all these other people that I think aren't getting it, they got it long ago. And I'm one of the last ones, which kind of throws the egoistic thing. I try to remember this sometimes when, if I, yeah. when I'm feeling a bit too, um, above the, Oh, I, I've got all this. I know all this, these other people they're they're just not, they're not thinking properly. I just a reminder, but who knows if, the, if this is a time loop and we've been living this a thousand times already maybe they they all figured it out that's why they're not conscious here and i'm still one i'm one of the last ones figuring it out so um but again the whole point is it's not a race you know truth is not a race truth is just truth is just the inner need that something has pushed you into a corner life has pushed you into a corner in such a way that you've said this world is so insane on some level and I mean, of course, in the last three years, it, it's shown itself, but it, it's been insane ever since we've been born, right? Yeah. And it's like, it's um, at some some point, people say, this place, there's something so wrong with this place. I need to find an answer. I need to find an answer. And the general answers we've been given early in our life, whether it be religion, whether it be science, whether it be whatever, when you reject that, the, the early answers we've been given, and now you're left, well, what have I got left? nothing. And that's the beginning of a search for truth. When you realize that <clears throat> everything you've been told up to that point is a lie on some level in your life. And you're realizing I got nothing to stand on now. I'm literally foundationless. It's a scary place to be, but it's also powerful because it means now you're free to examine anything and everything. And you're free to choose or not choose now what you want to bring into your you know, story of beliefs. Uh, if somebody go, it's what's one of those things we have to hack through, which is this mountain of belief we live under and questioning every single one. Where did it come from? Like, if somebody has a hundred thousand beliefs, I'm almost going to guarantee you no more than like a thousand you actually came up with yourself. They came from mom and dad and teachers and television and movies and your friend next door. And, you know, they came from all outside that we just accepted on some level, as opposed to something that went through an actual experience, actual work on our part, actual testing. And we were able to say from now, my experience and what I've done, this is, you know, I have this belief because of it. Generally, why do you have that belief? I don't know. Isn't that, isn't that what you're supposed to believe? 
uh, it's, well, no, it's sort of weakness get to... too. I think people lean on a crutch. You know, people automatically need to lean on some kind of crutch, like belief in a savior, or, you know, because it it makes this world more tolerable. Belief in anything, just a belief that you're sitting in a chair, that you're sitting, you have a table in front of you. That's a belief. You've mm -hmm. never, you, you haven't tested it. You know, like it's something I did. I, I tested reality, right? It took six years between like about 2000 and 2005, 2006. I tested reality on a daily basis. I went through very difficult exercises day after day after day to try to find out is reality solid? And the answer always turned out to be no. It's very transparent. It's very, it's like everything here is a ghost. It got to the point where I had to hold on to chairs when I sat down because I wasn't sure the chair would be there when I would sit on it. Wow. Like it literally, it was, it had got to that point where reality was just an absolute um, non, non tangible force. And I've had some people talk, Oh, you must have taken, you took all those drugs. Did you take all those drugs when you were younger? Uh, very important. Uh, I, I didn't. And I don't uh, all of, all of the work I did was all from, exercises that came from the teachers that I had had, which was about how to alter consciousness in safe ways and controlling ways. And mm -hmm. um, because the, 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 you know, a drug can open doors, but the drug is the one that takes you through the door and the drug is in control and yeah. you get something, but it demands something from you. And so I'm really lucky that everyone I had as uh, teachers in my early life said, you want to learn how to do this by, by, altering consciousness yourself and um but yeah i tested reality for six years and it failed miserably but i but the problem was the problem was i was still real reality was fake but i was real mm -hmm. and then it wasn't until i had the death experience in the canyon when i finally realized oh yeah i'm as fake as the world right the thing that i see in the mirror every day that's just as fake as everything else and that's a pretty that just in itself, just that, I mean, that that's called awakening, right? What awakening really is, there's realizations where you see through the world. That's a realization. You, you, you realize something is not what you thought it was, but a, re, a, a, a true awakening is when um, your identity changes. Whatever you have identified with previously as I am this is no longer there anymore. You can no longer identify yourself as that. You're now just, I don't know what I am anymore. Uh, but I know everything I identified myself with is not me. That's an awakening. And it's, if you don't handle it very well, if you don't, if you don't integrate it properly, it can take a long time to deal with it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of pitfalls afterwards before, <laughs> before ever even getting to it. And um, I went through 10 years of, difficulty it's interesting what you said about uh drugs because there, there's some evidence in certain old texts i've read that um drugs can get you can sort of get you there but it's always there's always um it's only to let in like the negative polarity ultimately um did you find that in your in your research or, I mean, I can say kind of briefly because I was an alcoholic for a, a large portion of my 20s. So, I mean, I, I had a, I wasn't using that drug for any kind of spiritual work, but there was a, there was a reason I was using it. And, and so when I, when I talk with anybody over the years who, who was an addict of some, some case, there was always a discussion of the, it was something we got, you know, someone's, if they're, if they're taking drugs or they're, they're drinking or they're whatever, or you're overeating or whatever, you're getting something or you think you're getting something from what you're doing. But if you ask that person, but the, the, you had to give up something as well for it. Oh yeah. They would always say, Oh yeah. There was a price. I, there's a price mm -hmm. you had to pay to get what you might say. The, and that, and that's what happens. It, it sets up. Um, Carlos Castaneda writes about in his books really, really well, that there's this like two way street that gets, that gets set up. It's giving you one thing, but it's demanding something else from you. And usually what it demands is always more than what you get. So it's one of those things like I know in Castaneda's work, he was kind of eventually he got to the point where he, he realized what, what was really going on with all that. And he kind of said, you know, in certain situations, in certain cases, somebody might need it, you know, once because just for some reason there's a door and they just can't get through it. And okay, this is the teacher says that, okay, this is what you need one time kind of thing. But as soon as you start 
having to go back to it, as soon as you start having to rely on it, in my opinion, you're losing that power of doing it yourself, of learning the abilities of how to be, uh, to not to be in control. It's one of the things that was very important on my journey work because there was some dangerous stuff that happened in some of journey, things I didn't like. But because I was in control, I could just stop, open my eyes and be back here and kind of go, oh, crap, you know, that was, I got to refigure out what to do there. Mm-hmm. And that's an important part of being in control at any time. You, you, you are, you, you, I think that's an important part of anything to me is, is, is holding on to that control. Um, so it, it doesn't mean like, again, that, you know, there's, there can be a time and a place for everything, including the, including the medicine plant experience. Um, but a person should know specifically why they're going to it. There should be a, a teacher who's who's agreeing that this is the right time for you, and it should be get what you need and and then gain the tools you need to work without it. From that point, how to how to gain your own power? Um, that to me is like anything. And at the heart of exit decay, that's kind of the heart of exit decay, right? It's we have the we are the most powerful beings in the universe. Actually, most people can't believe that, but actually. A divine sparked human being is the most powerful, amazing creature in the whole universe. And we've been so cut off from our own power, we can't even imagine what's our own power. And a big part of the journey of going through all of these difficulties, lies, negativity, whatever people want to call it, is the end result is just your own divine power, your own spark, your own totality. And that's a pretty good thing to reach if that's the end goal of what you can find. So yeah, that's why for me, uh, some you you, you you have so much negative stuff to say. It's so it's so bad. It's like <laughs> I'm just the end result of it is just finding your totality and your own total power. That sounds like a good that's thing. Important. To me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. For sure. yeah. So, I I do believe that this realm is sort of governed by the adversarial force, whether people want to call that Satan or whatever label they they put on it. Where is God in all this? Where is the positive polarity? And how do we get there? How do we become prepared to get out of this, get out of this place? Do you have any theories about like, try- cuz I do think there's an a, there's a intelligence, right? Like at all, you know, far above everything. Yeah, this is a challenging question for people. Um I can only share like how Gnostics, how Cathars, how a lot of these groups that the, the, the Church of Rome exterminated um, a few hundred years ago presented it. And, you know, if the Church of Rome is exterminating you, there's, there's, there's a reason they're doing that, that you, 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 you know something. And they all tend to show that what we can call Plato's cave or what we call the matrix or this simulation it's it's a giant thing. It's not just the material world. That's where people get fooled. It's the material realm. It's the etheric realm. It's the astral realm. It's the angel realm. It's the super duper realm. It's it's the void. Even it's anything where there is any possibility of duality, meaning experience and experiencer. If there's if there if there can be an experience and, ex, and an experiencer having it, you're in the matrix. Simple as that. It's vast. The matrix is vast, but they talked about how outside of this matrix is what they they called it an absolute. They didn't. They 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 were very careful to not label it. They just called it an absolute. Sometimes they did call it a, a divine father, but they meant it as a father mother. They meant it as a because it's a totality, so it's not really father. They they would sometimes talk about it in its in its feminine term. Sometimes they talk about it in its masculine term, but that exists outside of the matrix outside of this place. Hmm. So what we have going on in here, when we see good and evil, the good that's here is not really the good that's outside the matrix. It's just a opposite of evil that's here, which is designed just to make sure that the evil continues. It's a very strange thing. Now, as I've come to see it, this outside, this, this outside totality, we'll just call it the absolute totality uh, to, to not try to label with words. Um, I feel puts information, gets information into the simulation, gets information into the matrix. Um, uh, you can see that as like uh, Sylvia in the Truman Show. You can see that as uh, David and Jennifer in Pleasantville. Things from outside the bubble coming inside and having information available for those who want it. So I think there is, there are these things that are available 
within within the dream, but they're very subtle. They're very subtle in this reality, and they're they're not easy to tap into, and they're not easy to notice when a message is being presented to you. Uh, again, Castaneda has a whole book. That one's called Power of Silence, which is all about just what he calls knowing when intent is talking to you. Intent, in his case, would be a word for that which is outside the matrix, is, talk, is, is presenting information to you. And so those things are there, <clears throat> and it's our, it's our job to learn how to, how to react to those. It's, it's also like the, um, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, right? You have uh, uh, God reaching his finger out to Adam, but Adam's reaching his finger out to God. There's a little bit of both. The, the intent is coming in, but if we don't find ways to reach, try to reach ourselves back there, nothing will ever possibly touch. And it has nothing to do with the material world. So the, what we do in the material world is more just being helpful. If you want to be on the good side, you're just being helpful to other beings. Now, that's still being aware that there are energy uh, what, what should we call them? Expenditures that are going on. And that doesn't mean it's, it's a whole long thing. I don't want to get into it. It's, it's a, it's a massive, we could talk for two or three hours just on that topic and what that means and, and, and how these ancients tried to understand their day-to-day -day actions in all these realms in, in the stamp from the standpoint of energy. Um, but to me, that's where people get trapped. They think, the better, generally, the better I am, the nicer I, the nicer person I am, right? The 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 gooder I am, the more God will like me. That's usually how it's set up. The more God will like me, so the more the more gifts I'm going to get, the more the more good the more good fortune is going to come to me. The more the more the better my life is going to be. It's it's a it's a way of getting stuff generally for people. Most people, most people have an underlying, if I do good things, then I should be getting a winning lottery ticket, a new boat, bigger boobs, a uh, uh, <laughs> person in my life, a new car, whatever, right? They yeah. think that, that there's a, some kind of correlation as opposed to there's just experiences going on in the moment and there's no tally sheet that's going on. This is another very difficult thing for people to realize. There isn't a tally sheet that's going on in some outside. They try th These beings are going to try to fool you and think that there is. That's a mm -hmm. big part of the after-death experience is this life review. And they are going to play that life review on you to pull out as much guilt, shame, suffering, uh, um, uh, regret as possible. Uh, it's why I talk so much about the recapitulation for certain people whom the recapitulation would be would be right for, which is your life review, which is to have reviewed your entire life from now going back to birth so that there's nothing in your life experience that is going to surprise you should that life review get thrown at you in the after death world. You, there's nothing, you, you know your life, you know your life intimately. And uh, you, know, you know what stuff you've done that weren't good and you've, tra and you've already transformed. You know, that's one of the things that happen in the near-death experience, right? They go, they have the life review, they meet the beings, they see you, I've been a terrible person, I, look how egoic I was, and then they come back and they make the changes. Well, why don't you do your life review now, find out how you're an asshole up to this point in time, <laughs> and make the changes now, you know, based on what you've seen. Yeah. I can say from like my life review, it took me four and a half years, the first one that I did. And it was unbelievably transformative when I was done. But one of the one of the sickest things that came out of it for me was um, the loops in my life. I would see how many things I would do over and over and over again. I saw in one group I took I took three girls out on the exact same date. I mean, to the same restaurant. We walked on the same canal. We sat on the same bench. I mean, I probably if I could see it perfectly i what probably the same conversation and i thought am i am i that boring am i that <laughs> useless that i can't even come up with like something new to try and and this there's things like this from doing the life review that that does just should shock you and make and make you make massive changes so if there is value to the life review and there's very little in the after death state that really is because it's there to trick you but it has it has value here so if people take it and come back and get value for it, why not do it right now, get the value from it, and then you can just ignore it in the after death state because then you don't have to have all the guilt and whatever shame thrown in your face. You say, yeah, I've already done this. I've already done all my transformation. I became a better person. Thanks. Good, good luck to you. <laughs>
to be fair, nobody likes picking dating locations. I'll say that from personal experience. But yeah, very good. Very good points. Well, you know, I, I'm living in Ottawa at the time and there's like, what, 150 restaurants? You think at least I could pick like the one across the street, <laughs> you know? It was, um, but, it, but that was just an example. It was like, I could see over and over and over again how many things I was doing the same way, the same, the same actions. And so... Um, it was only after I did the, the life, my uh, life recapitulation that I started taking the ideas of not doing really seriously, which is breaking all of your patterns, which is doing the opposite of everything that you do. Um, because I knew the only way I could stop being uh, robotic was to purposely make myself do crazy. I did crazy stuff for like a year just to, just to really screw with my mind because my mind couldn't handle when I was, when I would do something absolutely totally opposite to normal behavior it would freak out and that was the whole point it was like eventually you 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 get the needle off the record groove and you start being able to get some freedom to just what do i really want to do in this moment but as long as the the needle's on the record you're going to do the same thing over and over and over and over again and that as we know is only going to take you to the same place over and over and over again hmm. all right well uh we're running out of time uh but uh maybe some parting words on uh, of possibly hope for people uh, and also where uh, can people follow you buy your book all that good stuff well I think there's there's a ton of hope um, but not for this realm that's that's for me that that's once I've learned that this realm I mean here's the thing yeah it's an it's an insane world but it's been built to be an insane world you know so if you're in a, if you're a computer game character in a computer game, why would you spend all your time trying to fix the game? The game has been the game has been produced the way the game is produced. So instead, it's best to say, okay, I know how the game is produced. So I know that if I go through the blue door, that's a really bad thing to happen to me. So I'm just going to stop going through the blue door. I'm not going to try to fix the blue door or change. I'll just, I know, ignore the blue door. So the first step, you can start to navigate your world a little better when you start realizing it's set up, it's set up to screw with us over and over again. So how can I start avoiding that? How can I start avoiding the traps that are here? And then we start to begin stepping back and saying, okay, what is it that's most important to me? And this is, if, if I could leave anybody with a statement it, it, or a piece of information, I guess it'd be this. It is, what is it you really want? And you don't have to want what I want or, you know, you want or what it's, but the person watching right now, what is it you really want? Like if you're doing work, you're doing exercise, you're reading books, you're reading philosophy, why? And that really deeply ask yourself, why, what do you want out of it? What is your, what is your goal? What is your purpose? Take your time. Don't answer immediately. Take a few weeks if you need to really think about it because once you know what you really want, it gets very easy to know what you should do. Because what you should do is just things that will help get you on the pathway you want to walk. And then once you make the choices of, okay, this will help me, now you make commitments. This is, again, this is, it sounds so simple. This is, has some of the greatest power imaginable. Making a commitment and sticking to it. Start simple. Say like, every day after dinner for seven days, I'm going to do the dishes. I'm going to make sure the dishes are done every day before I go to sleep. Okay. Seven days. Sounds simple. That's it, but do it. You've now just proved you can handle that commitment. Now you make another commitment. Now another commitment. And now you can start making bigger ones. Now you can stop smoking. Now you can stop drinking. Now you can change. You know, people make these uh, these um, New Year's Eve um, resolutions, right? Going, I'm gonna I'm gonna start doing this, and they last two weeks. Right. Why? Because they have no they have no power of commitment. So those by making small commitments, you start proving that you know how to do them and you can make them. The other thing commitments do that's so powerful is it stops negative forces from getting in your way. How often do you notice this? You make it. You say you're going to do something, and then. The universe throws something in your, throws a curveball at you. you. Oh, your sister calls, something comes, and, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can't do that. I got to cancel out. Oh, sorry. So the universe knows how easy it is you can be thrown off from your commitment. Richard Rose, again, a guy, have, he had a, he, when he first started teaching, he, he set up a, a um, like a thing every Friday night. And every Friday night, either his wife or one of his kids would get sick, and he always had to cancel. And finally, he told them one day, he says, I don't care if you're lying on the floor with gunshot wounds, dying to death. I'm going to go and do my, my talk that I have scheduled on Friday. 
you know what? The illness has stopped. They just ended. It's like the universe knew he was serious. So we're just going to stop playing that game. It doesn't mean all of your problems will disappear, but it means the ones that are coming from the universe, which is attempting to stop you from getting what you want, those will end. Those will just stop because once you have commitment to do things, so now it becomes, it, it's a, this is a power. If someone says, are you going to come to my party on Saturday? The best answer to say is, let me think about it. Because if you say yes, you have made a commitment, you have to do it. Like if you get run over by an ambulance, or if you get run over by a car on that day, when the ambulance comes to get you, your first, an- your first thing you should say is, can you take me to the party I promised to go to? <laughs> Literally, that's how strong your commitment should be. So it's better to say just no, I'm not coming to your party, or maybe I'll let you know. Mm-hmm. Because as soon as you say yes, you've committed yourself to doing it. And that's, then there's, but there's power because every time you say yes, you commit it, you do it. You lead yourself in a totally new way. And it also means, think of how many things you'll say no to now. That, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll come to your party, sure. And now you, oh, I don't really want to go. How am I going to get out of this? Oh, well, maybe I'll drop by. And then, oh, you don't go. And now you feel guilty for three days. I'm going to see him on Tuesday. What am I going to say? Now it's just so simple. Either, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going. I don't want to go. Or, yeah, I'm going. I'll see you on Saturday. Your, your life begins to simplify. So for me, that's how I, I would leave you a beginning of the whole work on this journey is know what you want and then start taking all of your commitments to doing what you say yes to and saying no to what you want to say no to. And that's a big part of regaining your power because knowing the truth about the afterlife and knowing the truth about what's going to happen after you die starts with regaining your own power and trusting yourself. So it's all a process. And I know it sounds, it can sound negative for a lot of people, but I hope everyone made it through the the hour or whatever we've been here, because that's the whole point. It's regaining your own power. And uh, these are some ways to start doing it. And um, if you're looking into more of that stuff, yeah, you can, that sort of stuff is more in Falling for Truth. That's a book I wrote wrote a little while ago. Exit the Cave is uh, the one that we've been talking about here more about uh, the soul traps. If you go to my website, egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com, I know it's a terrible name. You'll probably have it in the description below. Um, you can get information on all the books or sample chapters. Uh, you can buy Exit the Cave there as a PDF file because I want to make sure it's a, it's available cheaply for people. Um, then you can go buy hardcover copies on places like Amazon or any any major, um, major bookstore. Uh, my YouTube channel for now is still running, Howdy McCoskey Talks and stuff on a variety of subjects there. And... Um, other than that, I, I just hope that um, you get an opportunity to just ask yourself some some deeper questions and 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 maybe reevaluate a couple of things that you've always believed that now you're willing to just make some questions and look into and and look in look in deeper for and that's that's part of what the journey is. It's just just asking more questions and coming to our own answers. Awesome stuff, Howdy. I want to thank you so much for your time. And uh, I hope you come back because I, I want to ask you all about your your other work on uh, the World's Fair and stuff like that, that which is also really fascinating. Uh, if people want to pick that up. So um, thanks. Yeah. And I just want yeah. And, you, and uh, you know, it's um, this is one of the great things I've had about doing um, these interviews and things over the last few years. I get to meet people like yourself. Like, you know, here's a he's a really good person. This is somebody that I wish the world was different because it'd be great to just go grab a coffee and go for a walk somewhere and chat and share some stories. And it's kind of a shame we don't get to do that. But I'm also glad I get a chance to meet people like yourself because it shows there's a lot of really honest, hardworking people digging into answers, looking for truths. And it's nice to meet people like yourself and and um, share the journeys together. Absolutely. Likewise, we're we're out there. You know, this is a great way to kind of get your tribe together if nothing else you know we can find people yeah. that are similar and and actually be able to have tolerable conversations so uh thank you for this conversation again howdy and um yeah. hang out for one second if you don't mind uh, i'm gonna stop the recording but thank you again